In 1979, he had already been thrown out of the metal band Black Sabbath on the grounds of increasingly erratic behavior fueled by drugs and alcohol. Ozzy Osbourne? No. You know, you just get stoned and you do. We took cocaine, we took vast amounts of uh, marijuana. Ah, just before we get started, this video is brought to you by Sheath. Important, please show the actual Sheath underwear on screen at the beginning of the integration. Well, I suppose I better go get changed. Just joking, no one wants to see that. This is some sheath underwear. You're gonna hear more about them in a bit. Essentially, it's extremely comfortable underwear that works in a rather unusual way. Yes, that's right. More on sheath in a bit. Ah, hello there. Welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. Yes, I'm your host, Simon. This one's celebrity legends, we all believe. This is, I mean, Growing up, it was always about Richard Gere and a gerbil, which I always felt was like, why? No, that's obviously a lie. <laughs> and this was like the original misinformation, unless it actually happens, which, I mean, I just don't believe that's really possible. I mean, I guess it's possible, but no, it didn't happen. That just seems so silly. Uh, celebrity legends, we all believe. Danny writes it, I read it. Sam sprinkles in some of the finest vintage memes that you've ever seen, and let's get into it. Whenever anyone brings up the name Bob Holness around a pub table, there's a good chance that at least one or two fascinating facts about Bob will be thrown into the discussion. Well, one of them, I've no idea who the fuck Holness is. One of the fascinating facts about Bob is that he was one of the very first actors to ever play James Bond. Maybe he was, was he? What? Uh, and the other fascinating fact is that he played the saxophone on Jerry Rafferty's classic 1978 hit single, Baker Street. I have Danny, are you just making this shot? Because I've never heard of any of this stuff. On the face of it, both of them seem quite unlikely. Bob Holness is fondly remembered by most British viewers. Whoops, <laughs> not me though. Uh, as the host of the gentle tea time quiz show, Blockbusters, which ran from 1983 to 1984, a little bit before my time there. Well, isn't that interesting? Of course, a lot of people don't read. Everyone watched Blockbusters. I wouldn't be surprised if Simon reveals that he appears in it at some point. <laughs> He's on bloody everything else. Did I tell a follow-up to the Art Attack story? I didn't realize that being an Art Attack was important. Like, I just thought there was some weird British show. But everyone was like, holy sh**. Some dude found it. He found the f***ing episode of me appearing at Art Attack, which I had looked for forever. It was on some, it was dubbed into Chinese on some crazy Chinese pirate site. And this absolute legend found it. I sent him a t-shirt. I was like, thank you for spending hours. Here's a, here's a t-shirt worth $20 for all your hours of work. But I mean, I didn't have to, so I guess it's a nice thing to do. But uh, more importantly, what a legend. Good old Bob, but I've never been on Blockbusters. I would have been minus four to plus seven. Uh, <clears throat> in age. I was born in 1987. You see what I'm saying? You got to think, partner. You don't what want to- What the fuck are you talking about? Good old Bob was the serious, smartly dressed, mild-mannered, and reassuringly efficient guide through those 12 years of general knowledge trivia. Some might dare to venture that he was a bit dull. He often came across as a nice teacher, although not the kind that was any good at telling jokes. And he would have probably have never noticed that most kids were just mucking about at the back. He was a likable and friendly TV presence. Outside the blockbuster studio, Bob Holness spent the majority of his career as a radio presenter with occasional spots on light magazine TV programs. You certainly would never have expected to see such a straight-laced personality anywhere near a saxophone or James Bond's Aston Martin. But, in fact, the James Bond thing is completely true, although you don't exactly see him as it was on the radio. Oh, there must have been like an adaptation of James Bond for the radio before the movies. The very first actor to ever portray James Bond was Barry Nelson, who appeared in the 1954 live TV adaption of Casino Royale on CBS. But this was a very different depiction of the character, as the Bond on show here was an American spy working for the Combined Intelligence Agency. CIA is Central Intelligence Agency, pretty sure. So, I guess that this was their version of allegedly. <laughs> A uh, young Bob Holness was the surprise casting choice of the next James Bond in a South African radio adaptation of Moonraker in 1956. Although he sounds quintessentially British, Bob was actually born in South Africa and had returned there for a brief spell in the 1950s. So, the future host of Blockbusters became the second ever actor to play Bond and arguably the first to portray an authentic version of the character recognizable from Ian Fleming's original books. How does it, how on earth did the American James Bond version working for the CIA, Combined Intelligence Agency, what on earth did that have to do with Casino Royale? It's a bit weird. But 
Did James Bond also play cracking saxophone riffs on the side? Well, for over 20 years, a lot of people seem to think so. It was frequently reported in newspaper articles and online biographies, and even his own Wikipedia entry, that Bob Holness was responsible for writing and performing the striking sax solo on the massive global hit Baker Street, which is notable for inspiring a boost in saxophone sales and renewed interest in showcasing the instrument in pop music, TV commercials, and movie soundtracks. The Scottish rock singer Jerry Rafferty had neglected to credit the saxophone player on the actual record, which seems a little thoughtless, as it's the most distinctive element on the track. Just for the record, the real saxophone player went by the name of Raphael Ravenscroft. Which is a pretty kick-ass name, if I'm if I'm being honest. But the mysterious lack of credit led to more than a little mischief in later years. Broadcaster Stuart McConey is the most credible culprit for the spreading of this false rumor, although he had his tongue planted firmly in cheek at the time. Back in the 1990s, McConey was assistant editor for the New Musical Express, and he composed a weekly comedy section called Believe It or Not, which was blatantly a ridiculous selection of made-up facts and figures about the music industry. <laughs> this would be great. It's like. Yeah, what's your new channel, Simon? Oh, it's just called Made Up Facts. What do you do? Absolutely no research. We just make some shit up and present it as a video. It's not even entertaining. It's just lies. That would be very easy and also very lazy and also kind of a... Who thought this was a good idea? Who greenlit this shit? I guess the 90s were a desperation for content. One of the bogus facts that McConey came up with was in 1990, Bob Harness played the saxophone solo on Baker Street. The gullible souls who believe this to be true may have also believed some of the other incredible revelations from McConey's column. For example, pet shop boy Neil Tennant is apparently a fully qualified rugby league referee, and David Bowie, Bowie invented Connect Four. <laughs> there are some absurd ones though, where it's like, oh yeah, like, who's that guy in that famous rock band who also has like a physics degree? He's like a doctor of physics. And it's like, Sh okay, <laughs> and it's true. Although I reckon McConey was the first one who came up with the silly notion of Bob Honor's moonlighting as a saxophone player, others have also lamed claim, laid claim to look cooking up the urban myth. Broadcaster Tommy Boyd reckons that he came up with the idea 10 years earlier in 1980 when he was running True or False, a quiz show on London's LBC Radio. Bob Honor's was also working for LBC Radio at the time, which Tommy claims inspired the bizarre concept. Even the real saxophone player, Raphael Ravenscroft, wanted to take the credit. He claims that he'd been working with Bob on an advert for Robinson's Orange Squash. He told a journalist that Bob was the real saxophone player on Baker Street. <laughs> what a legend. Raphael Ravenscroft, not only is your name legendary, but you have a great sense of humor. Uh, just because he was sick of being asked about the record. I think maybe Raphael just wanted to at least receive the official credit for something. I do hope his eyes gaze upon me and that my allegiance is recognized. I don't know. Notice me, senpai! Notice me! Poor Raphael. Regardless of whoever might have started the wild rumor, it continued to fester for well over 20 years and even made its way into several obituaries for Bob Holness died. Uh, into several obituaries for Bob Holness after he died in 2012. Bob himself has always been happy to try and dispel the myth when asked about it, but it appears that not many people were listening. Spare a thought for Raphael Ravenscroft, though. Not only was he denied an official credit on Baker Street, but he was only given a flat fee of just £27, and the cheque bounced, so he was never actually paid at all. Oh, Raphael, you've got screwed in every way, and you're still a legend. And he's still with that legendary name. I have tried to channel your anger, Raphael, but more remains. Anger clouds the mind. I bet he often felt like giving Jerry Rafferty a virtual gold finger. Butter Bob Bob. Whenever Baker Street was played on the radio, Bob might have been able to help with that. But when it comes to exposing the rumors, allegations, and porky pies that have dogged celebrity lives over much of their career, the truth can often leave us shaken and maybe slightly stirred. Where's Richard Gere? He always appears in this. He always appears in this. He always appears. 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 Right, Danny? Right? Danny, we're getting close to the end. Oh, he's not featured! This is really long. We should get going. Michael Jackson wanted to be white. No, he didn't. He had that skin disease. It's not uncommon for a pop star to undergo a fresh makeover from time to time and proudly show off a new look, but it's a little more surprising. One of the biggest faces on the planet appears to undergo a complete physical transformation within the space of about a decade. Yeah, I mean, Michael Jackson, I, I mean, I know he had that disease and stuff. Why did he also look like a woman, though? 
He grew his hair like, it was like super straight black hair, like down to here. He also had a nose. It seems like he wore like lipstick. It seems like he went from like a black dude to being a white woman. I mean, I know that the, the, the skin disease, we can't like, you know, I don't want to make, you don't, it's not appropriate to make fun of that. But like, why does he also look like a woman? That's got to be choice. And his nose was like, that's, that's choice, isn't it? I feel like we can, but then also, oh, Simon, he had a mental condition that made him unhappy with his appearance. So, well, okay. Yeah, just like a woman. So who the f can we make fun of? It's not fair. I just want to make fun of dead Michael Jackson. I mean, I feel like if it was more established that he was a bit of a pedo, then we could. But it's sort of contentious, isn't it? Despite that documentary where it's like, oh, oh boy. Oh boy. Uh, I was never the biggest fan, biggest fan of Michael Jackson. Some of his early stuff was okay. Sam and I often celebrate the dawn of another thrilling morning in the basement by performing the thriller dance. It's very impressive what the boys can do. Okay, open the door and let's take a swing at the motherfuckers. <laughs> Uh, but towards the end of Jackson's career, it just sounded to me as if he was largely hyperventilating into a microphone. It was certainly a long and successful career, which often courted controversy and deeply troubling allegations. But the allegation that I want to focus on today is that Michael Jackson purposefully bleached his skin over the years in a bid to escape his black roots and sell more records to a white audience. <laughs> That's absurd. Yeah, because white people hate buying black people's music. <laughs> Who the f thinks that? Uh, there's no denying that Michael Jackson, who performs, I mean, <laughs> there's probably like a really small subset of people like so racist that they won't li listen to black people singing. <laughs> Shit. There's, <laughs> that's f up. There's no denying that Michael Jackson, who performed the Thriller Dance in 1984, looked very different to the Michael Jackson, who topped the charts with Black or White in 1991. Uh, the latter signal was perhaps an unfortunate choice of title and theme, as Jackson tried to convince us that it don't matter if you're black or white, but the world couldn't help but notice that his skin tone had become considerably lighter over the last seven years, and many critics were quick to conclude that Jackson was was purposefully, purposefully evolving into a white man for commercial reasons. Critics, it's so stupid. The author and academic Stephen Shaviro observed that in a white supremacist society, he wanted to become right white. All right, Stephen, chill the f out, mate. And even Jackson's former friend and mentor Quincy Jones joined in the global condemnation, lamenting that Jackson appeared to be ashamed of his race. He's always trying to justify it and say it was because of some disease he had. Bullshit. Except he had vitiligo. Except he did have a disease which turned him white. <laughs> this disease is a real thing. <laughs> During an interview with Oprah Winfrey in 1993, Jackson was asked outright if he had bleached his skin. He denied the allegation and revealed that he suffered from a condition called vitiligo, a rare disease which destroys the pigment of the skin and creates colorless blotches and patches which have been gradually spreading across his, across his skin since the early 1980s. There's no cure for the condition, but Jackson told Oprah that he had resorted to using thick layers of makeup to even out the skin tone. Ah, just like a woman! Not everyone was buying this, though. Perhaps it's because, in the very same interview, Jackson denied having undergone any major cosmetic surgery to alter his appearance, aside from minor work to fix up a broken nose. Dude, I mean, your nose is very, very different, though. <laughs> it's very different. <laughs> no, Blake, it's stop. It's ignorant. You're being ignorant. It was blatantly obvious to anyone with the mental capacity to compare a couple of photographs that Jackson had undergone a forehead lift and significant cheekbone and lip surgery. Of course, that's his own business, but it understandably cast doubt on the denial of the bleaching allegation in the same interview. In fact, though, Michael Jackson was telling the truth. Following his death in 2009, the autopsy confirms that Michael Jackson had indeed suffered from vitiligo. Dozens of bottles of FDA-approved skin whitening creams were later discovered in his property, but these were clearly used to help combat a very serious and unpleasant disfiguring condition. Jackson himself had always been proud of his roots and had no desire whatsoever to lighten his skin for any perceived commercial benefit. It's true that a troubled life appeared to take a heavy toll on Jackson, and he looked increasingly frail in his, re in his later years, but uh, probably also all the drugs. So there was a lot of drugs, right? Uh, but the rumors of skin bleaching turned out to be completely off the wall. I'm assuming off the wall because Danny's capitalized it is a Michael Jackson song. I don't know it, but uh, but up, up, up. Also, he was using, if I understand it rightly, like because of the vitiligo, it'll just uh, damage skin pigment in a specific area. Like say, if you've got it on your cheek here, and then the whitening cream he'd used elsewhere to like make it smooth and blend better or something like the makeup. Um, so, yeah, no, Michael Jackson didn't want to become white. What the f***? I'm glad to dispel that rumor. 
Maria, completely, and now we've solved the problem. <laughs> ah! Now, before we continue with today's, might I say, glorious video, let me talk about today's equally, maybe even more so, if possible, glorious sponsor, Sheath Underwear. Yes, that's right. Sheath are boxes that are designed to keep your balls, yes, this is for you, men. Off of your legs. She says, I don't really feel that that's quite selling sheath for everything that it does. It's got three compartments that keep everything down there separate and cool and comfortable. Yeah, that's more of the selling point. Like, I don't know. I'm not someone who's ever, ever had a problem with balls, like, being stuck to my legs. And I mean, I'd have to be wearing some really tight trousers or have some, I guess if I was a bit bigger, like my thighs would be, then you'd have the thing. But that's not really what, what works for me, is it just keeps everything just separate and more comfortable. Like I've talked about this before, like typically I'm a boxers dude. Like I like everything loose, but you know, that's also got disadvantages because the boxers move around and you're like sorting out a wedgie and stuff like that. And it's just generally not the best. And also I just don't understand briefs, like anything that keeps it way too tight. I'm like, why are we doing that? That just, that's just horrible. But what Sheath does is uh, it's like the best of both worlds. And I mean, it doesn't sound like I'm like brief suck, but uh, no. What sheath do is there's three uh, pockets. You put your uh, you put your balls in there. Then there's this little little. There's this absolutely massive hole, uh, which you put your. <laughs> it's just a regular sized penis hole. Ah. What? Then you put your put your willy through. Goes into there. Balls in there. Legs in the traditional normal way. <laughs> obviously and uh yeah it all sounds very weird and i have to say it's a little bit weird to talk about isn't it but uh just give it a try and you'll be like oh okay i understand and this is why like i actually like don't find it super weird to talk about because like when you actually do it you're like okay yeah i get it super comfortable <laughs> Traditional boxer briefs are barbaric. Agreed. Uh, there's the, I, I already described how it works, so I don't think I need to repeat everything that is exactly here. Just less chafing, less readjusting. Yes, everything is separate. Makes it less smelly. Wow, I'd never even considered that, but I guess so. I mean, yeah, you're gonna be sweating less. Obviously, you're gonna smell less, and I mean, no one likes that. <laughs> that smells like ass. They were invented by a US Army veteran who came up with the idea for sheath during his second tour in Iraq, where it's hot as hell and his boys needed to breathe. Yeah, I've heard about Iraq. It can be pretty hot there. Also, if you're in the military, you're up to start like, I don't know, you're probably gonna be sweating anyway. He's like, oh, I'm gonna get shot. Ah! Uh, call to action, that's what we need. Yes, so click the link below and use the code blaze at checkout at, or go to sheathunderwear.com forward slash blaze for 20% off. Add in something about doing your balls a favor because they'll thank you. Like, we discussed that already, they really will. This is this is genuinely a really nice thing to try. You might think it's a bit weird. Just Then just get one, try it, and then you'll be like, oh yeah, I get it, okay. And then you'll be back, and then your whole underwear selection will be sheath. Oh uh, yeah, there's a link below, all that good stuff. Back to today's video. Maria Tomai wasn't meant to win an Oscar. I'm sure we all remember the most farcical and disastrous moment in the history of the Academy Awards. Oh, and well, they got the envelopes wrong, of course. In 2017, La La Land was mistakenly declared to be the winner of Best Picture, and it wasn't until the cast and crew had taken to the stage to receive the award that they learned, to their dismay, that the real winner was actually Moonlight. Awkward. <laughs> but some people believe that a very similar incident occurred much earlier in 1993. Oh, but they covered it up? No. Yes, on that occasion, the Academy decided to avoid potential embarrassment by simply not owning up to the mistake. <laughs> Jack Palance had strolled onto the stage to announce the nominees and eventual winner of the Best Supporting Actress Award. Rumor had it that Jack was looking a little disorientated as he drew close to the pivotal moment. He struggled to read, read the winner's name inside the envelope, looked in confusion at the teleprompter, and then just blurted out the name Marissa Tomai, who jumped up from her seat in excitement and approached the stage to accept an Oscar. It was certainly a surprise result, to say the least. Marissa had been up against such Hollywood heavyweights as Vanessa Redgrave and Judy Davis, who had appeared in su such earnest films as Howard's End and Husbands and Wives. <laughs> never seen any of these, never heard of any of these people, except for I've heard of Vanessa Res Redgrave, which had been released late in the year to keep top of mind with the panel. In contrast, American actress Marissa Tomel Tomai was largely unknown at the time and had been nominated for her role in a low-key oddball comedy called My Cousin Vinny. I have heard of that, though. 
uh, released almost a year earlier, in which she played a loudmouth chatterbox alongside Joe Pesci. The theory is that Vanessa Redgrave's name was hiding in that envelope, but she was cheated out of an Oscar because Jack Palance was either too drunk or too stoned to identify the real winner. He had picked the name Marissa Tomei simply because it came out came last on the list of nominees and was the only name that he hadn't that hadn't yet rolled off the teleprompter. Holy sh**, my dude! I mean, this is a these are celebrity legends we believe are true. I even said it's a legend. This isn't actually what happens. But goddamn, that would be quite the cover up. And the Academy just decided to ride with it as they wanted to avoid red faces. It's all complete twaddle, though. The Academy has officials waiting by the sides of the stage to jump in and intervene if a mistake is made on stage. And that's exactly what happened in the case of La La Land in 2017. They didn't act fast enough, though, did they? They were like, oh! Look again, mate! <laughs> That's the wrong envelope. I'm so sorry. Here's the correct one. They were like, woo, get him on stage, woo. Oh, 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 oh. Oh shit, I'm sorry. Should have happened much faster. Jack Palance could have never gleaned anything of value from the teleprompter, as it only contained stage directions such as open envelope and announce winner and go back home. <laughs> get the f out of here, Jack. Uh, this is to ensure the presenters have to look down to concentrate on reading out what's right in front of them and to avoid any spoiler being glimpsed on the teleprompter. But most tellingly of all, if you go back and watch the footage, Jack Palance never really stumbles or falters for a second. He simply reads out the correct name on the card. And the Oscar goes to Marissa Tano in My Cousin Billy. It appears that this was a malicious rumor purposefully started by people who didn't think that young Marissa Tomei was worthy of winning the Oscar. And it may allegedly have been spread far and wide by other seemingly very bitter colleagues within the movie industry itself. <laughs> the movie industry being bitter? <laughs> Never. That, that seems unrealistic, Daddy. Marissa Tomei absolutely deserved that Oscar. Oh, there's a fucking surprise. And the actress herself showed good humor while taking a swipe at the allegations during a monologue on a 1994 episode of Saturday Night Live. She revealed, I was just the happiest I've ever been since I was named Miss Teenage America back in 1987, the year it was hosted by Jack Palance. Or well, three years later when I stepped onto the stage to receive the Heisman Trophy from Jack Palance. The only award I ever felt slightly guilty about was when I was 16 and I was named Employee of the Month at a Roy Rogers restaurant by the assistant manager, Jack Palance. Saturday Night Live's not that funny, is it? <laughs> Stevie Wonder is not really blind. Yes, he is. <laughs> I grew up thinking that Stevie Wonder was a bit crap, largely because all I'd ever heard of the kid was the cheesy dross that was pumped out. Largely because all I'd ever heard as a kid was the cheesy dross that he pumped out in the 80s and 90s. I wouldn't wish I just called to say I love you on my worst enemy. It took me a while to discover the back catalogue and realize that during the 1970s at least, he was one of the most amazing artists of all time. But even though he may have sold 100 million albums worldwide and picked up more Grammy awards than any other solo artist in history, it would prove to be a bit of a downer if it was ever found out that the most famous blind person in the world wasn't really blind at all. He had just been putting it on for a bit of a giggle. Is there someone there? Who's there? Is someone here? I can't see you. Because I'm blind. Surely at some point, someone's gonna hear this rumor and like throw a rock at him. And he's gonna be like, whoop! And they're gonna be like, Stevie, I got you! And, but the reality would be the rock would just hit him in the face. And that person would get in trouble for throwing a rock at a f***ing blind guy. This might sound ridiculous to some, but it's a conspiracy theory which has mushroomed into in popularity in recent years. A massive chunk of the internet is convinced that Stevie Wonder enjoys perfect vision but has been faking it all these years, either as a jolly prank or a novelty marketing gimmick, which he was forced to keep up for far longer than he ever intended. If you find that hard to believe, just check out the ever-growing pile of evidence Stevie Wonder regularly gets courtside seats at basketball games and has been spotted cheering on the action, despite the fact that he's not meant to be able to see any of it. Well, probably because he hears other people cheering and he just wants to be involved. During a 2010 performance with Paul McCartney in the White House East Room, video footage shows clumsy old Paul knocking over a big microphone. But there was no need to panic, as it just took a split second for Stevie Wonder to instinctively reach out and grab it before it could hit the floor. That's a bit, but holy sh <laughs> Immediately afterwards, he cheekily nudges fellow musician Herbie Hancock in a move which has been interpreted as meaning something along the lines of, whoops, nearly dropped a massive bollock there, 
but I think I got away with it. <laughs> oh, Stevie! And several big names have voiced their own suspicions on Stevie Wonder's condition. Boy George is reported to have made a claim that the Motown artist once approached him from a distance at a party and launched straight into a surprisingly accurate playful tackle, which ended with Boy George in a headlock. When Lionel Richie appeared on the Kelly Clarkson show, he revealed that Stevie Wonder once invited him into his car parked on the driveway to play a new track to the cassette player. <laughs> just Stevie's just sitting in the driver's seat like, what's up? Uh, we're not going anywhere, right, Steve? Right? <laughs> okay. After putting on the banging new composition, Stevie then fired up the car and started reversing it down the driveway. I've been spending my whole life with him thinking he can see. I know he can see. Uh, meanwhile, NBA legend and underworld kung fu fighter Shaquille O'Neal, or Shaq, as we no, by now on Brain Blaze, related a story of the episode on an episode of Inside the NBA in which he bumped into Mr. Wonder in the elevator of a Los Angeles apartment building at which they were both staying. Shaq was wandering into the lobby when he spotted Stevie in the elevator, and it appears that Stevie spotted him. He greeted the NBA star with, What's up, Shaq? How you doing, big dog? This seems like amateur blind, like the bumping of the microphone and catching it. Sounds like the sort of the, like unpreventable like mistake that you could make as a blind person. But like this obvious shit, it just feels like the sort of mistake that a fake person who's pretending to be blind wouldn't make. Maybe he can smell Shaq. Maybe he's like, I smell Shaq. <laughs> okay. Blind Guy McSqueezy, how do I describe it? It is a character I've been workshopping whose lack of vision gets him into all sorts of trouble. There are also reports that Stevie Wonder was a bit of a mischievous youth and often played pranks on his friends and family, but what kind of elaborate planks, pranks could a blind boy play? And could the whole blind thing be the biggest and most mischievous prank of all? Well, nah. This, none of this evidence really stands up to close scrutiny. The source of the Boy George story can't be found and was probably made up by a conspiracy theorist. Stevie Wonder may have taken Lionel Richie for a very brief trip backwards in the car, but he was just fooling around. And both Lionel Richie and Shaq were clearly playing for laughs when they shared their anecdotes on TV. Stevie might appear to enjoy a basketball game without vision, but then so did millions of other basketball fans when they turned in on the when they tuned in on the radio before the days of TV. And it's likely that he could instinctively sense and hear the sound of Paul McCartney his accidental mic drop at the White House. The subsequent nudge with Herbie Hancock is just a common gesture that blind people often use when trying to re-establish their surroundings. I have a confession to make. I, um... I'm blind. You what? But perhaps the biggest question that conspiracy theories fa theorists fail to answer is what would be the point of trying to maintain the pretense of blindness for an impossibly long period? When little Stevie Wonder first signed to a record label in 1971, he wasn't looking for another gimmick. This incredibly talented musical prodigy was just 11 years old. What more do you need? Nothing more. This is a stupid conspiracy theory. And it would be tricky to get through the whole day pretending to be blind without inevitably slipping up at some point. But now imagine doing it for a whole week. And now imagine doing it for 60 f***ing years. I'm blind, Carl, not stupid. The truth is that Stevie Wonder was born six weeks premature and wasn't given the right amount of oxygen in the incubator, which resulted in retinopathy of prematurity. The growth of his eyes was aborted and his retinas became detached. You could see the significantly damaged eyes for yourself when he removed his glasses during his acceptance speech at the induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1989. Stevie Wonder may enjoy the odd prank from time to time, but he's definitely trying to pull the wool over our eyes with this one. Bada bom bom Not appropriate. Ozzy Osbourne int intentionally bit the hat off a head off a live bat on stage. I feel like this is one that could be easily disproved because there's maybe no evidence for it or it's like super shaky evidence or something. Long before Ozzy Osbourne embarked upon a more mainstream chapter in his long career in which he became the star of reality television, famous for star famous to struggling to get his words out. Oh my God, familiar. <laughs> Siri. Watch the lifespan of a chimpanzee. Falling backwards off chairs and shaking like a shitting dog, he used to be known as the Prince of Darkness. He did? In 1979, he had already been thrown out of the metal band Black Sabbath on the grounds of increasingly erratic behavior fueled by drugs and alcohol. Ozzy Osbourne? No. You know, you just get stoned and you do. We took cocaine, we took vast amounts of uh, marijuana. Although he would later kiss and make up with the band in 1997. But one of his most notorious moments occurred in 1982, relatively early on in his new solo career, when he allegedly chomped into a live bat during a stage concert in Des Moines, Iowa, and tore its head clean off 
in front of 5,000 devoted fans. It's kind of thing you might have expected from the Prince of Darkness. He was certainly playing on his devilish persona at this point. He was the Hellraiser who was wildly out of control. The posters for the gig had depicted Ozzy wearing horns and a cape, along with the slogan, just when you thought it was safe to go back to a concert. At the bottom of the poster, it warned, eating before concert is not recommended. But had Ozzy really plans to tuck into a live bat during the concert. There's no question Ozzy really did bite off the head of a live bat on stage. It was seen by 5,000 witnesses, but it certainly wasn't planned. Poor old Ozzy thought it was just a toy rubber bat. And he thought it was a rubber bat, whatever, and he picked it up and bit the head off. And Sharon's going, Dummy, it's real. I'm like, what? Oh, sh So he actually did it? Wow! Oh yeah, intentionally. Oh my god. So he actually did this. That's super intense, dude. Ozzy had developed a habit of throwing quite unusual concert souvenirs into the audience during this period. Whereas mo most artists might set off with throwing guitar picks or drumsticks into the crowd, Ozzy had bizarrely opted instead to throw bits of meat and animal parts at his breath. That's... Oh my god. <laughs> Ozzy Osbourne, what is up? And on occasion, one of his fans decided to throw a bit of fresh meat right back at him. Ozzy reasoned that it must be a rubber bat, as nobody in their right minds would throw a real bat at him. Would they? In his own words, he recalls, I put it in my mouth, and then its wings started flapping, and I got such a shock, I tried to pull it out too quickly, and its head came off. My mouth was instantly full of this warm, goopy liquid. I could feel it straining my teeth and running down my chin. His final verdict on the bat was it tasted crunchy and warm like Ronald McDonald's. Ozzy Osbourne, you f***ing psycho. <laughs> there seems to be a little difference of opinion on whether the bat was alive or dead when it was thrown, although Ozzy recalls the flapping wings and the warm gloop. The fan most likely to have thrown it at him, 17-year-old Mark Neal, revealed after the concert that the bat was long dead and bordering on rancid. Ozzy was rushed to hospital straight after the concert to get his rabies shots, but he felt perfectly fine following his brush with the bat, or at least so close to perfectly fine as Ozzy was capable of reaching in 19. 1982. <laughs> so Ozzy Osbourne's still alive, right? <laughs> Holy sh! I can imagine living so hard for so long and still. Be I mean, I know he's super like, uh, but like still being alive, it's quite remarkable. He might have lost a few marbles along the way, but surely even Ozzy Osbourne never intentionally started chewing on a live bat. Or then again, maybe the truth is even stranger than fiction, as was the case just one year earlier in 1981 in a story verified by multiple sources. Ozzy and Sharon, his manager, future wife, had set up their first meeting with CBS Records in Los Angeles in preparation for the US release of his debut solo album. The whole thing was meant to just be a friendly get to know you, and Ozzy had decided to stuff three live doves into his pocket. Pockets, which he planned to release. It's fucking pigeons. <laughs> Where are you going? We're just going to a board meeting. It's like, it, I'm taking three live doves. <laughs> yep, because I'm Aussie, fucking Osborne. Legend. Right. <laughs> that cracks me up. All right, mate. Maybe it was meant to be a hopeful symbol of peace between the artist and the recording label. Yeah, until they start shitting everywhere. They're basically just glorified pigeons. Or maybe he just wanted to give the impression that he was a heavy metal magician. But either way, by the time Ozzy stumbled into the boardroom at 10 a.m., he was already completely off his tits. He quickly grew bored with the meeting and rudely interrupted a PR woman to ask if she liked animals. <laughs> when she replied, they're going to be all dead, aren't they? <laughs> oh, Ozzy. <sighs> Oh, when she replied that she did, Ozzy pulled out one of the live doves, ripped his head off with his teeth, and spat the carcass onto the table. Fuck, Ozzy! God damn! He did exactly the same thing with his second dove to the horror of the screaming. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what to say. In the second one, while the third one got the screaming executives, while the. Oh, sh. While the third one got away and started all over the room as everyone dived to the floor. <laughs> Ozzy and Sharon were evicted from the room and told they would no no would never work with CBS ever again. <laughs> worth it. <laughs> but CBS released the debut album anyway and it performed better in the US than any other Black Sabbath album than the, any other Black... <laughs> and it performed better in the US than any Black Sabbath album had managed for eight years. When the truth is this batshit crazy, why would anyone need to start making stuff up? That is f***ing crazy. No Richard Gear though. Anyway, this has been an episode of Brain Blaze. Ozzy Osbourne, what a mental case. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Where's Richard Gear? He always appears in this. He always appears in this.
He always appears. 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 Right, Danny? Right? Danny, we're getting close to the end. Oh, he's not featured. This is really long. We should get going.